Last week we were in the book of Samuel. This week we're going to be in the book of Samuel. So turn to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. You'll be reading with me in verse 13. He says, Now therefore behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reign over you continue following the Lord your God. But if you will not obey his voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Now for, therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. I want to talk to you this morning and give you a little history of what's happening here in 1 Samuel 12, verses 13 through 16. Up until this point, Israel had not had a king. And they were asking Samuel, we want a king. We want a king. Give us a king. And God says, no. You know, Samuel was very upset. No, God is your king. God is the one you follow. You don't need a king. God warned them that if you had a king, that he would take a tenth of your cattle. They'd take a tenth of your money. I wish it was just a tenth today, don't you? But he's talking about how a king would take things from you and he would set up armies to be over you and all the rest and could control you. And God says, I am your king. But they kept complaining and saying, we want a king. We want a king that will lead us into battle. We want a king to be over. And this all started from Samuel. He was a man of God and they followed him. They liked Samuel. He was one of the last judges in the Bible. But Samuel's sons didn't really follow in his footsteps. And they were doing things wrong. So it sparked interest to the people that we want a king that would follow the Lord and to serve the Lord. We want out from under your sons that are doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And so they asked for a king. And then here we read in Samuel chapter 12 where God gives them a king that they have chosen. They ask for it and God and his permissive will. Everybody knows that there is God's perfect will and then God's permissive will. So God says, all right, you want a king. I'll permit you to have a king, but it's not my first choice for you. So what does that got to do with today? What does that got to do with the 4th of July weekend? See, we have governments and people to govern because men are evil. See, we get this backwards. And man, I I did some research and you wouldn't believe some of the trash out there about our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And But it's interesting to me, some of the things that are being taught today and how we're trying to be misled. But God gave a king to Israel because the people were evil. He said, I want to be your king. If it was a perfect world like God designed it, he would be on the throne, right? We wouldn't need a king. Now, he would set up governors and stuff and people to sort of oversee and to take care of the people. We'll see that in heaven. We saw that in in Israel, in the tribes of Israel, how Moses set up people over the different tribes. But God was their king, and the people would bring their problems to a particular person. That particular person would then bring the problem to Moses. Rather than having 700,000 people all come to Moses at the same time. This is order. This is a type of government. God created that. And people say, oh, there's not a God. Oh, we have this government and all the rest. The Constitution gives me my rights. The Constitution does not give you rights. It guarantees your rights that you already have and are given to you by Almighty God. That's the truth. God gives you your rights. The Constitution in our government is there is to enforce and to guarantee that my God-given rights aren't infringed upon. That's the truth. That's going all the way back to the root of why we have a Constitution. Listen to me as I read the first paragraph or so of the Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers, when they decided that we would pull away from the king of Britain, that there was a lot of problems, that he was doing a lot of evil things, and they wanted out from his, uh, his control. 
So they started the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of God entitle them. Our founding fathers understood my rights don't come from man. My rights come from God. So the laws of nature and the natures of God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which implement them to separation. We hold these facts to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with a certain unenable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And they begin that, and our forefathers understood that our rights as human beings comes from God. God instituted a government and put a government in place to make sure those rights are not infringed upon. Those rights are kept and not taken away from us. So he's saying here that these rights were given to us, governed by God. We developed a government that would be governed by men and women or the people to guarantee our rights. So it's not just me. Our forefathers knew that. I believe the Bible teaches that. He's telling this that in our text a little bit, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes. But I want to look at the declaration and, and this verse that everybody, or this section that everybody knows that we find these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator. And they have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So let's look at the word creator. See, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, God made it clear to them there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. See, therein lies a lot of the problem with these people here. And some of the things I saw, I saw a caption as I was studying this. It says, we got to be careful that our rights come from God. That that's not a true statement. And I just... For kicks and giggles, I read his article. Well, it turns out he's an atheist. He don't even believe in God. So how can he even say that our rights aren't from God? And he, he went on about a big tangent, and I'm not going to go there. But first, we need to understand there is one God. There is one God. And for you not to think that there's everybody except an atheist believes there's a God. You can't look at this vast universe. You can't look at all around you and say there's not at least a God. Just about everybody I know will say, well, you know, I've got a good friend I've witnessed to for years, and he even acknowledged there's a higher being. I'm not sure what it is, but there's a higher... I can't believe that all this just went boom, and here we are. That he believes, he even believes, even though he hadn't accepted him or acknowledged him as the only one and true God, he believes that there is a creator that put all this into place. And man, I've been looking at messages and studying things about stars and our galaxies. And man, if you can't look at that and say there's a God, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. For what we can find out now, what God has shown us about His majesty and how big, if you can't look at that and say that there is a God, you can't see. you got your head in the sand. So the, first of all, they understand that there is one Creator, and that's God Almighty. So they understood that. And they said all men... It was in the Bible that they gave them such a strong sense of importance that an individual, that every individual was important. Acts 10.34, Then Peter opened the mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
See, they were having a problem back then that only the Jews could be saved. And, and Peter opened the Bible and said, no, it's not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles. It's for all who will believe and accept him as his personal Savior. God is not a respecter of each end. Of, you're not important than her and she's not important than you. God said, all who will come to me, I will accept you. God is not a respecter of birth. All men are created equal in God's eyes. All men are sinners and need a Savior. And if you accept that personal Savior, then Jesus, you come to me. I accept you. It is a free gift that I have given to all men. So all men are created equal. God has given us the ability to have life. He came that we would have life and have it abundantly and to have the sacredness of life. See, I think that's a lot of problems today in our world. We forgot the, how important, how precious, how valuable life is. Leviticus 24, 17 says, if you are to kill someone, they'll kill you. They'll take your life. That's how important life is to God. He said, he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. Pretty plain to me. That's ordained by God. Let's go on to liberty. Romans 8.21 says, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Liberty is ordained. I have come to give you liberty, to have liberty and freedom in Christ. All these things that are in our Declaration of Independence that are throughout our Constitution is for the life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That's what this is all about. And God has given that to us. The pursuit of happiness. Does God want me to be happy? Some people struggle with that. And, and it does, does being happy, I'm having trials and I'm going through a tough times. Am I happy? Not necessarily, right? So we could talk a whole nother message on the difference between having happiness and joy. Does God want you? But I believe He does want us to have joy, to have peace, to have happiness. And that's ordained by God. Psalm 16, 11, Thou wilt show me the path of thy life and in presence of the fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I think God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? To have joy. Psalms 37, 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. So I'm going to delight myself in the Lord and pray for Mercedes, right? That's not really, well, that's a whole other message there too. If I'm delighting myself in the Lord, that means I am constantly focused on him, what he wants for me. And as I go closer to him, as last week I said, I hear his voice. I hear him speak to me. Then I have joy. His desires now become my desires. I'm not praying for Mercedes if God doesn't want me to have a Mercedes. But see, are my desires become his desires? That's what that verse is saying. That we would have joy. The thief comes but to steal in John 10.10 10, and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you have life more abundantly. God is all about giving us life and joy and happiness and having peace. John 15 and 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy might be full. You think God wants you to have life? You think he wants you to have, be happy and have joy? Of course he does. But see, the thing that we need to understand and going back to our text, I read that for you to look at we asked for a king, and we need a king to govern. We've asked for a government. I think Benjamin Franklin said a government is a necessary evil. Basically what it is. But it's important. But look, it's also ordained by God. Only God can give the government, only God can give Donald Trump the power he has. Only God can give Putin the power that he has. Only God gives that authority. 
And those who don't understand that better be checking up. Because he said here that I have get, that you've asked for a king and the Lord said, I have given you, I have set a king over you. They asked, God in his permissive will said, okay. And then he told Samuel who the man was. He set the king in place. They didn't. They just asked. And out of God's permissive will, he told Samuel, I'll show you the man. And he showed him Saul. So God said it. So only God gives power. John 19, 10 through 11. I like this verse here. This is powerful. Jesus was standing before Pilate and said not a word at his trial, at his mock trial. And then Pilate said unto him, Speakest thou unto me? Could you imagine? The creator of all the universe standing before you and saying, You better talk to me. He didn't know who he was talking to, did he? He had no idea who he's talking to. He said, Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Old Pilate was sort of full of himself, wasn't he? See, he had forgot where his authority came from. He forgot just how small he was in the eyes of God. And Jesus answered and said, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath a greater sin. Now he's talking about the Israel betraying him. But he said, you have no power at all, except God gives it to you. Pilate at that time was probably one of the world powers. He was probably the most influential person in all the country. Powerful. Full of himself. Jesus says, you're nothing except God gives it to you. All these world leaders, all these people who want to politic and I'm going to do this. You're not going to do anything unless God lets you. You're not going to do anything except God lets you. And if we could get back to if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Then will I hear from him. If I would humble myself and understand that I'd stand here this morning because God put me here. I speak this morning because God gives me these words. If you're a boss in your company, you're there because God puts you there for a purpose. We need to humble ourselves before him and understand that any authority, any power that I have comes from Almighty God. Daniel was before the king. And they were in this conversation. Daniel says, Thou, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You're a king of kings. You have all the power and all of everything, but it comes from God. Daniel reminded the king of that very statement. Romans 3, 1, he said, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. We'll get on this little peon for a minute. What does that mean to me? I'm not president. I'm not a congressman. I'm not a mayor. I'm a nobody. But if God gives them the authority... I better be subject to that authority, right? That's tough these days, isn't it? That's tough today. When you see them doing all the things they're doing and you see the evil, and we've seen it throughout all the days, and King Saul was no different. He did evil in the sight of God, but God still told Israel, he's your king. You better respect that authority that I've given him. See, in respecting that authority, you may not like it. And I think of years ago, a couple of years ago, I probably preached a message on that. When do we, when was it all right for them to write this Declaration of Independence? That was their king. Should they have bowed down to him and did what he said regardless? So is our Declaration of Independence born out of sin? No, I don't think so. See, I think there's a point, just like Hitler, he was a ruler. Should we have bowed down to him? No, I don't think so. I think there's a point in which we have to say, okay, 
I will honor the authority that God has given you, even if I don't like it, but I'm drawing a line where it goes against what God teaches me what's right and wrong. That's where we can draw the line. When God gives us the authority to come out from underneath that, that authority by His Word. In other words, if somebody tells me to preach and support abortion, no, I don't. God tells me I don't have to. You tell me to do or say anything contrary to what Almighty God, the supreme authority says, then God gives me the right to step out from under that authority. I mean, just because they're taxing us 65% doesn't give you the authority. You may not like it, and I don't like it, but that's the God-given authority. Until He changes it, that's the way it is, as long as it doesn't contradict what God says in His Word. See, they gave, God gave them a king. You see, what we need to understand is that the authority and the power only comes from God. And that we're to be in submission to that authority as long as it doesn't contradict God's Word. And so that's why when He told him, He said, if you will fear the Lord and serve Him first. Not the king. Not the government. You understand that all they have and all they are comes from the Lord. You fear Him, serve Him first. And obey His voice and not rebel against His commandments of the Lord, then shall both you and the king reign. See, we need to understand today where the authority comes from, where the strength comes from. And in this Declaration of Independence, our forefathers, I believe, saw that. They understood that we are given these rights and these liberties by God. God tells us, I mean, all through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you read, God tells you how to live, how to live with your neighbor, how not to kill, how not to steal, all these things, how to put a government into place, how to put armies in place. God taught us all that. How can you say there's not a God? All that is very root is with God. And see, we need to understand that and we need to serve Him first. But he said, if you, and then if you don't, then I'll be against you. I think in America today, we're living in, in dangerous times where we want to shake our fist in the face of God and say, you're not even real. I'll do what I want to do. I have the authority to do whatever I want to do, like Pilate said. And God's just up there saying, okay, yeah, right. You have no authority except I give it to you. But that's the society we live in. That's the world we're living in where men are growing more prideful and more prideful and we're getting further and further away from understanding that all of our rights, and he spells it out clearly in his word what those are. I'll leave you with Psalm 71. It says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. And let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thy ear to me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked and out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. God didn't really want Israel to have a king. And I believe in the perfect world and at the end of the, the age, Jesus will be king of kings and Lord of lords. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. That's the way God designed it. That's the way God created it. And I'm asking you today, you don't need to sign a declaration of independence separate from him. See, our forefathers included him in every part of it. They understood that. I believe that's why God has blessed this nation. But if we're going to draw away from it and we're saying, you're not my fortress, you're not my king, you're not this, you'll see. 
He promises them, Israel, you can have a king if you want to, but you fall away from me. We got to remember that as a nation. We got to remember that as a people. When our government's not doing what we want and it just makes you mad enough, you won't break your tooth on something. God give them the authority. Let's do what we should do as Christians and submit to that authority for the testimony of the Lord. If nothing else, I need to sign a declaration of dependence on Him and Him alone. 